This is a story all about how my MMOs got flipped up and turned upside down. Now things may be changing, but do not fear. Call Tanlin, Chewina, and Flattis are here. This is Evercaster, so you know with all your gaming news with incredible flow. We have a special guest with us tonight as we discuss all the EQ Next news in sight. Please welcome Angie as she joins the show. She's a hell of a gamer with a love for MMOs, so be sure to sit back and relax for this is that show we like to call Evercast. Is enough. Enough of the same game already. It's time to get some new ideas into this genre. And if somebody was gonna do it, it should be EverQuest. We're at the point right now where we're building something that's both heroic and social. We've taken everything we know about games and MMOs in general and we're fusing the best parts into an original shape well, that we hope will uh, create triumph and, uh, and passion in the gamers that play it. See, we were serious about it being a sandbox game. Welcome, everyone. This is the second episode of the Evercast podcast. Uh, this title, this one is titled Our SOE Afterthoughts. Uh, my name is Tanlin. I am joined today with uh, Chwena and Flattis. Um, also, our featured guest today is uh, my wife, uh, the lovely Kylest. Uh, she's joining us. She is normally our chat room moderator. Uh, we thought we'd bring her on so that you guys could get a chance to know her um, and know who's doing most of the moderation. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, oh, what, wait a minute, why doesn't everybody say hi? Yes. Hi, say hi. Go Tan Republic! Oh! <laughs> That's Long right. show! <laughs> oh, is it? Reach out to the side too. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'll be back. <laughs> um, I just wanted to start out um, and talk a little about about who we are um it came up is in our after hours um segment of our show like who are these guys you know who and i just want to tell everybody that uh we're regular we're regular fans just like all of you watching um there's nothing special about us we're not paid to do this no one asked us to do this we just thought that it would be really cool and uh we we put a lot of time into it because we want it to be the best um, but we want to make sure that you know that we're not affiliated with SOE. Um, we um, try to be neutral and present an honest argument from all different sides and nothing is ever going to be staged or, or faked. Um, what you see is what you get. All of our interactions are real. And uh, when we disagree with each other, um, it's, it's going to be the reason. Yeah, I hear my, my wife laughs. When we disagree with each other, uh, it's going to be the real deal. Um, so I'm going to turn over um, the the first segment of our show, and all of our shows are going to start with an ECAST news segment. I'm going to turn that over to uh, Chwena, who's going to do the news. I feel like I need some paper. <laughs> we need to get a, a sound, right? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to ECAST news. No. <laughs> um, so ECAST news, real quick, we just have a couple topics. What we're going to do is every week we'll cover what's changing for us. This isn't really EverQuest Next related. It's just in relation to the show. Um, first off, I'm going to start with, we can't really speculate on anything. Um, now that we have news, we're going to try and focus on the facts that we know. 
we will give our input and our opinions on things, but we're not just going to blow things up. If there's an idea on Reddit that seems really cool, we might mention it, but we're not going to carry on as if it's going to become real because we kind of want to be your news outlet, your, uh, your place where you can get our opinions on things, you can formulate your own opinions. And with that, of course, we have our after hours, which is fantastic. Um, we do our hour segment show. After that, what we do is we go ahead and we welcome on you guys onto the show. So tonight we have Rec MMO, guy from the community, amazing guy. Um, he's going to come on, join us, and just talk with us for an hour nonchalantly. If you'd like to do that or are interested in joining us, you can uh, email us at evercast.show at gmail.com or just hit us up on our Twitter at evercast underscore show. You join us, have a lot of fun. Of course, we interact with the chat a lot during after hours as well. So if you don't really want to get on the camera, don't want to get on the mic a little shy, that's no problem. Just put your input in the chat and we'll talk with you. Um, and just a reminder, we do this show every other week. We're going to continue on a bi-weekly basis because there's still not that much information flowing about EverQuest Next. We're not saying that we won't do special shows in between, and we're looking to do kind of segment videos the week in between our shows. Um, but right now, we're going to keep it bi-weekly, so we have plenty to talk about. And so you guys are always entertained. So that's it for the ECAST news. We're going to turn it over to... Uh, Actually, we're going to keep it with me, and I'm going to introduce our guest, Angie. Um, so as you know, Angie, or sorry, Coleste, uh, she is our chat room moderator. She helps with getting our show set up. She helps with our social media. She helps with our graphics, stuff like that. She's a wonderful person. Met her at SV Live. It was a lot of fun. Though, unfortunately, I drank way too much, and I didn't get to uh, talk with her <laughs> enough. Talked with her a little. Um, but first, I just want to ask you, Angie, or Coleste, sorry. I will try and call you Coleste. It's really hard to now that I know your real name. Um, what got you into gaming, Calesta? Why do you like MMOs so much? Oh, God. Um, it, it's kind of a funny story. Um, I, a, a good friend of mine was playing... Um, am I allowed to say World of Warcraft? <laughs> a, good friend of mine was, a good friend of mine was playing World of Warcraft, and he wouldn't stop talking about it. Um, and uh, I decided, just for the sake of it, to, to play to see if I liked it. Um, <clears throat> And that kind of was my gateway to all things gaming. I, I had played a lot of video games before that, but that was the first MMO that I had played. But, I mean, I grew up playing Dungeons and & Dragons and LARPing and um, actually playing a lot of versus games, a lot of Street Fighter-style video games. Awesome. Well, something you guys might not know about uh, Coleste is that she knits like crazy, and she does some amazing things. It's, Amazing things. Is it not called knitting? It's it's crochet. <laughs> Crocheting. It's crochet. I apologize. I'm don't, don't call it knitting. That's, that's a cardinal sin. Um, I have to reverse that a little bit. It, <laughs> and, and it's it, it's Kai Lest. Kai. Kai just, call, just call me Kai or Kai. Angie. You can say Angie. I don't really care. Most people, if they don't know me, that's okay. Well, I'm sorry, Kai. Um, so basically, Kai came up with a great idea. Um, we're actually going to be running a contest, so I'm going to turn it over to her real quick to introduce that contest. She'll give you a little more details and maybe show you some of her work. Okay, so we decided um, after SOE Live, I had a crochet a dragon for our guild leader for Vanguard, um, which is why I went to SOE Live was for Vanguard. Um, crocheted a dragon for him and several people at SOE Live saw it and gave me some really good feedback and so I decided maybe it would be fun to crochet one um, kind of custom in the EverQuest Next colors so I was thinking maybe gold, silver, and blue and we're going to raffle it off or not raffle but do a contest for it and we're asking all of our viewers to submit their fan art um, and the winner is going to get a really awesome Dragon. Pull it back a little bit. Pull it back. Custom made dragon. There we go. So you guys want to win that. Um, of <laughs> course, you can submit your art any form. I mean, it could be a painting, it could be a drawing, MS Paint, 3D modeling, video, doesn't matter. Um, you can send it. I'm a <laughs> big fan of comics. If you want to do an EverQuest Next comic, I would love to see it. <gasps> oh, yeah, that'd be cool. Say? I want to be a dark elf. Make me a freaking dark elf, and I will love you forever. I don't want it. I do not want to be in it. Um, just make sure it's just make sure it's EverQuest Next related. Be sure to drop it um, to us on Twitter, or you can uh, email us once again, evercast.show at gmail.com. We'll put it in the chat for you. Um, you send in your art. You have two weeks to do it because we're announcing the winner next show. We'll have a little midweek video where we'll show some of the submissions. So if you get it to us by like next Thursday, we'll go ahead and show it to everybody else. But we'll judge. 
everything, there'll be one winner, and you'll get that awesome dragon. So Totally makes me think of Nagafen, because it's red. Where's your Nagafen hat? Don't you have that? Oh, right, over, right over there. It's over. It's, it, it is. It's in the other room. It's in the other room. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Kai. Um, basically, what we're going to do right now is go into our big block section, what I like to call it. Um, all of our hard-hitting topics, everything that we're going to discuss. And we're going to turn it over to Tamlin, who's going to kind of uh, introduce our first subject all tonight. Right, let me um, bring up the, uh, the web page that shows the eight uh, ability combat system, uh, where you can see that there is going to be the armor set that you equip, um, a class set that you equip, and between your armor and your class, you'll be able to choose a weapon, which will give you four abilities, and then your class will determine, will determine uh, four of your abilities. And you can see that we have our eight um, ability uh, set. So is eight abilities enough to make an action-packed MMO experience? Do you need more? Do you need less? And I don't know about the rest of you, but right before I went on to the show, I was watching uh, the Dota 2 Championship on another stream. And their prize pool was $2 million. It's $1.4 million for first place, 600,000 American dollars for second place. And I asked um, Calbor in, in our Skype conversation, I'm like, how many, how many buttons do they have? How many abilities do they have in this epic confrontational PVP style, you know, experience of gameplay? And he's like, well, they start with like three and then they have four abilities and then they have a couple more that they can add on. And the total was like 14 or 12 or 14, something like that. And I mean, if they can do it in that type of game and just have this huge money pool for their for their competitions, I don't see why they can't do it in EverQuest Next. And um, I think one of the, the challenging parts of this, this EverQuest Next debut is that the, the holy trinity of you've got your tank, you've got your healer, and you've got your DPS, and everybody knows exactly what their role is. Everybody knows exactly without fail what they're supposed to do. And we all have that that change fear going on in us. And it, we're like, well, that sounds different. And you know, that was my initial reaction. Oh my goodness, another MMO is trying to do away with the Holy Trinity. But I, I think that I am willing to give SOE um, uh, the benefit of the doubt <laughs> and let them go to, uh, uh, give them the benefit of the doubt and let them uh, show us what their MMO is going to be with eight abilities. I love eight abilities, I'll say that. Um, one thing you didn't mention is that every class, because of these, these abilities, so you have four class abilities, four weapon abilities, and then your armor, they said that armor is not going to really be uh, stat-based. It's going to be more like, okay, League of Legends example, you buy like a Rabadon's death cap, and you get like a clicky because of it. You get an extra ability off your armor. So think of it like that. Um, they're saying that the four unique abilities will make that class so unique that you'll have fun collecting them all, cl trying them out. If you played League of Legends or Dota 2 or something, you know that each character only has like five abilities, but they're all very unique. They all offer different play styles. And also during one of the panels, they did say that uh, comboing wasn't necessarily out. I believe, uh, I believe, I don't remember who said it, but they did say that there's probably going to be a combo system. So we're also talking about being able t to interact with those four abilities and have them kind of play off each other. Well, I think I that the, the example in the class panel that they said that, you know, um, you want to make a mage killing warrior, and so you equip him with the teleport ability, but if you equip him with the teleport ability, and they didn't say it, but it exactly, like, expel out how it was going to work, but they alluded to it, that you weren't going to have enough of a resource in order to use your teleport and then use, like, your whirlwind ability. And so in one of your item slots, you were going to have to um, equip something. And somehow that thing that you equipped was going to augment your ability set so that now you could use your teleport and your world win. And again, that's this resource system that we don't know anything about. They haven't even talked about it. We know we have eight abilities and we have weapon sets, but we don't know what, what resources are going to resources are going to be available. Yeah, yeah. I, whether it's going to be like one resource or two resources or whatever, I'm sure it, it could just be like an action bar or something like that. It, it replenishes and you have to kind of wait for it to replenish. Instead of having a global cooldown, you know, they can, they can determine how many spells a player uses and kind of limit the ability use from just one little power bar. But we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this... I was going to say, this is kind of what I was talking about in our prediction show, that, you know, I think we're going to see less 
um, action bars were, you know, less abilities, but bigger impact of those abilities. Kind of like with uh, the mage teleporting out backwards and then sucking everything in and blowing everything up. <laughs> right. Like, you know, and that's cool. I'm down for that, so. Yeah. That that was really neat. I liked that a lot. Super cool. And, and, <laughs> and also with the stats, you know, like I said, stat-based games are... Uh, they're 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 hard because you always have to just make new. It, that's exactly right. Gear, it, it, if, exactly, games. exactly. If, if you can get away from stat based gear, you no longer have stat inflation. And one of the key things that they kept bringing up about EverQuest Next is it was going to be horizontal progression instead of vertical progression. You have no stat inflation. You don't have to worry about that vertical progression. Yep. Yeah, there's, um, I think, I don't know if I can actually say it's official, but they said something about there not being leveling. I think it was just a, a little comment they threw in there somewhere. It wasn't like officially announced, but they, uh, they did announce that the cool thing, which is awesome because we all love having different classes, but a problem with the games like Rift, other games that have multi-classing abilities is that you play that one class and you level it up, but then you switch to the other class and all of a sudden you can't really play it as much or something like that. Um, so this, it's basically going to be when you use a class, you gain attribute points. And you can put that into any class you want to kind of unlock right. the tree, to unlock new spells or whatever, however you want to use it. And then you can take those spells and kind of merge them with other classes to kind of make something. And I know we're going to get that to that a little later, um, whether classes should be based off lore or anything like that. That's on for the, our roundtable section. Right. Um, but it is a really important topic, and people are kind of blowing up. Well, I, I saw that we had Dave... Um in the channel earlier, so this question, you know, maybe he could answer it for us, but <laughs> the, the Sony PlayStation 4 is coming out. We know that yeah. it doesn't have eight abilities, and so that, that theory that we could see this game easily ported or maybe even, you know, launched to come available on the, on the PlayStation 4 is sort of a reality, isn't it? Oh, totally a reality. I, I can answer that because I, I watched uh, through Curse, they had the uh, question uh, panel. Uh -huh. And uh, I quote Dave uh, that they're concentrating on uh, PC format right now, and uh, they'll go from there. So they go go from there. Go from there. So we'll. I think we'll see a, a PC rollout, and uh, we could possibly see a PS4 rollout. Maybe you know anywhere from six months to a year after launch. I'm sure it'll be post-launch. So yeah. so Kyles, since I know that you enjoy rating. Um, does this scare you that they're not going to have the Holy Trinity in rating? Do you, does this? Do you do you think that the old school rating is still going to be there? Do you think that you're still going to have like the ten mans, the twenty five mans, the forty man raids if you don't have this sort of Holy Trinity? Guys, see, that's a really hard question to answer. The, so the the first thing that I'll say when it comes to change in anything is that we are resistant to change by nature. Um, so my initial snap reaction when there was like no holy trinity was like oh my god what are you thinking um but at the same time it's kind of revolutionary i like the idea of taking those those like really clear-cut rules away i don't know how it's going to affect rating i don't know if um if it'll still be raiding so to speak because i kind of think raiding oh there's my tank and i'm healing my tank and those guys are dpsing and if they die i don't care um as long as my tank doesn't die um I don't know how that's going to affect rating as, as, as a whole. I think you have to create new encounters. You, you, I mean, rating's boring anyways, to a point. I mean, it's fun. No, it, rating is so fun while you're figuring out the strat. But once you get over that gear hump and once you get over that strat hump, it's just right. boring. You're grinding, and that's not fun. Um, and it takes developers so long to author new content to create it interesting. And there's only so many like strats that you can put onto a mob depending on the engine and stuff like that. You can try and create new stuff, but it's still limited based on how you build the engine and, and hold, how old the tech is, stuff like that, or just how creative you are. But with the dynamic AI possibilities in EverQuest Next, um, Dave Mark was talking a lot with us. We can't say too much, but I think we can say that mobs can flank you, all right? So right. we're talking about <laughs> you, you play an FPS and you're playing against Call of Duty players. Well, that orc that's in front of you he's not just going to run at you because you get into aggro range. He's going to actually weigh the benefits. If you are a warrior and he is a mage, he's going to back off from you. 
And he said, um, Dave said that you, they kind of travel in packs, like um, Dave Georgeson was actually saying with the camp of orcs and his example of that. Um, basically, if you're running into a combat situation against a group of five orcs, they're going to strategically position themselves based on what they are. Warriors in front, mages behind, a leader. They might all fall back to protect that leader instead of rushing at you. And they might send one little orc out to flank you to the side. Who He might constantly adjust his position, wait in the woods, and just wait until you guys are vulnerable and attack you. Wait so these kind of... This kind of dynamic combat situation has never been seen in an MMO or even an RPG game to that matter unless it's pre-scripted. So raiding could be hella fun. What if that dragon, to use the lore example from the story if you guys have read that, what if that dragon, it, you need a norite blade to attack it? Well then you get your crafters to start finding norite for you so you can kill the dragon instead of him destroying your cities. And that could be a raid that's completely dynamic, it's completely emergent because it's not even planned. The developers put the dragon out there, and the dragon decides to attack oh. you, and you guys have to figure out how to kill that dragon. So I don't think you need a, a set raid. They did say there would be raids, but I don't even know if it's really necessary in the next game. Raiding is going to be really, really different, I think, the way that they have all of the, the stuff set up. And, and we're getting a lot of people saying that I'm cut in half and need to res me. So I okay. don't know. You're good to go now. We fixed. So. Okay, okay, I wasn't sure. Sorry. So, yeah, okay. bl blame the engineer, the technician guy. Tamlin's our engineer. Oh, huge shout out to Call. <laughs> Call did not make it tonight. Um, poor guy. He stayed up all night. If you guys know, uh, Call's our other host. He's from the Netherlands. Um, he was watching Dota 2 all day, right? And he's like, I'm not going to sleep because of Dota 2. <laughs> and then his it, his ISP just cuts out like. 30 minutes before the show. So he's in here with chat helping us moderate and stuff like that. Right. Unfortunately, he just couldn't make it for the and, show. And, and I'm sure yeah. he's dying because he has so much stuff he wants to talk about. And that's one of the reasons why we're having some technical difficulties is setting up the uh, the four person and with the five person and everything's all a little screwy. But I think that I've got it all fixed out right now. Um, so, Real quick before we switch subjects, um, what do you guys think about... Guild, okay, Guild Wars 2 does the same kind of combat. It is different. They already said it's going to be different. I think it's going to be more like um, a God of War combat, or if you guys played eight, uh, Reckoning on the PS3, it's going to be more action-based like that. It's not going to be like so uh, so restricted like Guild Wars 2 is. But there's a problem, and Call brought this up in our predictions episode, is that when it's all dodge mechanics and when it's everything, um, it becomes really iffy, like who's doing what and who you need to support. And they said there would be support roles. But they really have to nail home that support roles are viable in combat. And even though you have to do damage, you need a some kind. You need a way for the player to be able to read what's going on instead of just chaos. Right, and, and that's where I went back to the, the the Holy Trinity. People are comfortable with it. People want to see it because it's it's when you pick the role that in that group, you know exactly what you're supposed to do. And every time the a game company comes out and says, hey, we're going to do something new, and we're nixing the Holy Trinity, and, and there's good reasons to nix it, and that's because yeah. you know it's not a very intelligent gameplay from the NPC point of view. From the player point of view, it makes perfect sense. Aggro mechanic, you know how it works, you aggro it on. But every time they talk about nixing that and coming up with something new, you know, you have that initial fear reaction, and then there's the unknown. Like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do anymore. Do yeah. I need to stoke, Do I need to focus on doing this? And if I'm doing this, are you going to, you know, if everybody tries, you know, doing that same thing, all of a sudden there's a disconnect. And, you know, if everybody is supposed to be supporting one another to mitigate damage and no one is actually doing damage, then, you know, no one, the, the, the NPC doesn't die because no one's damaging. Yeah, combat was really slow paced in that uh, tech demo you guys saw too. I mean, it is a tech demo, it's really early, but it was like cast, 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 hit. And cast, 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 hit. It was very slow. The mob took a long time with his red indicator to attack. That could just be because they don't really have the fun action combat in yet. Um, what do you guys want to see? Do you want it to be more like turn based? hit, 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 or do you want it to be like more dynamic, like, oh, put your archers up on the ridge, they gotta fall back, flank this way, flank that way, based on like, fast movement. I will just say that what I don't want to see, because it's easier for me to say what I don't want to see, and I don't want to turn it into like the old gauntlet game, where it was, you just point yourself in a direction and fire off abilities, and don't shoot the food, and you're good. You know, you just kill everything, <laughs> yeah. just kill everything before it gets to you and, and you call it good and then move on to the next encounter. As long as it's not like that, as long as there's some sort of, you know, tactics and there are different roles and everybody plays a little bit differently, I'm, I'm sure it'll be good and it'll be fun. And I just, that's my one fear. I want to avoid that. 
Every time I'm at ten percent health, Tanlin shoots the <laughs> Tanlin shoots the turkey every time. <laughs> I would love to see a dynamic uh, combat system. It just makes sense. It's just we need something that's savory. I would like to say. I guess that's a, a good word to use. Is something a little bit deeper. I, I think we can get still deep combat. That's scary. Think about it, because. When you do, like, let's go with raiding. Raiding, as soon as you know the strat for the boss, you're kind of in, you know what, how to explain it. Oh, so, okay, as soon as he walks over to that pillar, we know phase two, 50% this starts. But if you're attacking and that, that, that mob or that boss has an intelligence to him, and he starts to turn unwillingly, you know, to something else, to do something else, like, oh, instead of doing my crazy AOE rain down at 50%, I'm actually going to just single somebody out and just, they're dead. How do you prevent that? That's going to be crazy. That's going to be so what, much fun. That's good. That's what it is. You, you, now, now it's not so much of a, and, and, and you know, you can like, instead maybe there could be cues, like maybe like Terra, there could be a cue where like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to see the Terra cue where their eyes just start to sparkle a little. <laughs> Cause that's, like, if they get a little glint in their eye, then it's like, okay, he's going to do something crazy. i got to watch out for the crazy move and dodge out of it. I, I think it would be, you know, some, they could do something, you know, deeper than that. I think you could develop something deeper than that and yeah, go from there. Well, think, Just, about, think about a castle. You're going in to uh, invade an enemy's castle, right? And you know the Goblin King's in there, and he has his archer set up on the wall, stuff like that. So you have to counter, and they counter. It's about, it's about uh, reactions to each person. The players react, the NPCs react, and it's a, it's tiered. So each reaction creates a new experience and constantly evolves the combat to a point where it's it's strategy based on like actual almost military strategy. You know, you want to yep. you want to put your squishies behind. It's 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 completely different. Um, hey, you want to have your tanks on the front line and then have your casters behind that. And you got to move yeah. traps yeah. too. Think about traps. You know what I want to do with that wall and the guys on top with the archers? I want to send somebody in, just a single person that can stealth to go to the bottom of that wall and yeah. dig a little hole and start soaking the ground underneath it to make that wall collapse. I want to be able to do exactly. that kind of strategy. That's what that's, I want to see. And I, I, did I, Rosie? I'm more thinking simple things like instead of having a tank which soaks in damage, you have a tank which like does... Um, um, area denial, right? Like, hey, I'm just gonna keep you know you in this one little area so that you can't move around. M limit your mobility instead of taking you. Um, and I think that you know that. Um, Tanlin, you're still in the early 2000s here. We're in the 2013 now. This is <laughs> this is EverQuest next. Oh, like, hey, a virtual reality game? <laughs> Fine, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I understand. I think a lot of people have that kind of mindset too. There's still, I mean, we've never seen anything like this. It, it's big promises, but how is it actually going to play out? Can they have these interactions smoothly to where it is almost like playing a PvP game and you're constantly adapting strategy? I don't know. A bit, uh, going into our next topic, constructability, destructibility, the three tier of the world, that's all going to play into it too. Angie said, you know, dig under the wall and maybe try and collapse or replace bombs there. Uh, there was a tweet either from Rosie or Dave or somebody that said, uh, there, there was an idea being thrown around that when uh, voxels were destroyed that they'd have an AoE effect when they hit. So if a wall collapses on you, you're going to die. It's not just going to bounce off you. So that adds a whole nother level of it, destroying bridges, destroying things to collapse on other players or other NPCs. And this all plays into PvP too, but I'm going to turn it over to you, Flattis, to go ahead and talk about the three-tiered world and all this kind of things that are possible in this new voxel-based uh, engine. Sure thing. And the first thing I think I want to go over is kind of uh, the kind of like what a voxel is, because I don't, you know, just in case somebody doesn't, it's not too sure what a voxel is. Um, we can kind of go over, you know, if you take your fingers and make three points, make a triangle in your finger, and then kind of fill that with like red. That's a, you know, that's a vertex. That's what we kind of deal with now in games. You know, most most MMOs out there are vertex-based games. Um, a voxel is more of a, uh, a points in space that we can see. Voxels, you know, they're kind of, you know, visible points in the 3D space. And uh, we want them, they're similar to a two-dimensional pixel. And what Sony has done, and, you know, With Dave's Voxel team, Farm, that's the... Yeah, NBA Voxel and, and Voxel Farm. Yeah, they, they learned to take those voxels. They took what they originally have done with the world 
which was originally block shaped. They've brought it down, smoothed it out, and they've made something that's what we see in our pictures, or even the like, even our background right there. The our lo- background, the lo- that's all yeah. voxel based. That's man. all that's voxel based. That's what? That's big. <laughs> and every and every big voxel, you know, and how they how they you know, and they figured out one of the big things is like all that's math. <laughs> all of our computers are doing math to render that, and they figured out you know the big you know secret that every little voxel is made up of a bigger voxel. So big block breaks down the little block, breaks down the even tinier blocks, and that's a big thing. And we should see, hopefully, you know, any PC. Like, I, I'm not sure what the range of PCs, because, you know, uh, specs haven't been, you know, PC specs haven't been released, but I'm pretty sure that we could see yeah. PCs that are a few years old being able to run EverQuest Next and still have it look beautiful and anybody we with a power. talking with Greg Spence, the lead programmer. He goes by Rothkar in EverQuest Next. He said that exactly. He said that uh, voxels are actually a better way to send data than polygons. Yeah. Like, you can eliminate load screens, and you can just actually send better information to the player quicker. And also, um, the world's procedurally generated underground, and I think it's also sort of generated... I, I don't think it's procedurally generated on top. They did say underground, though, with, like, the tiers, that they could have an earthquake and totally, like, remap Greater. the world underneath. I think, that's, yep. I, I think that's the, the, one of the best ways of creating new content. It's just, like, earthquake, shake everything up, and now everything that you knew about that, that second tier down, it might be totally different than what you're familiar with. And now you have like this new um, challenge of exploring this underground area that's been opened up. Yep, and that's, you know, what, you know, the other thing too is how our player abilities interact with the world. If I do a shield slam, miss the guy, and I knock a hole in the wall, then I find a whole new cave system. Right. And and then it gives me a whole new place to go explore. So what do you think if, like, and I've said before that I'm big on non-combat generated uh, content in the game, things that don't evolve around, you know, killing things. Um, but what would you think if that you were interacting with an NPC and they're like, you know, I, and they tell you, like, I was walking by, like, by the road and I saw something that wasn't there before and it must have been shaken up by the earthquake. You know, like that sort of discovery, like, or, or you know, hey, Bob over there said, why don't you go talk to him? I would love if the NPC Bob is in this game somewhere. Yeah, Bob just, is in the game? <laughs> just some guy named Bob. Bob <laughs> but what do you think about that non-combat driven search for the world, to, to explore the world? Because they really push that exploration is going to be huge. And I Listen, I am all for exploration in, in MMOs. I love MMO. I, th- I can, like, when I first logged, and I'll, I'll use World of Warcraft, it was one of my... When I first logged into WoW, I was like, oh, I spent hours just running around, like, exploring things. I didn't, I mean, I quested, but I was like, what's that? I'm going to go run over that. And then, you know, when I, when my little cousin saw me playing, you know, after many years, after you kind of get that burnt out stage, she was only 11, and I got her an account. And I was running with her, and seeing her look at the game, it made me think, like, when I first started playing, I was looking at this game with almost like a child's eye. This is a whole new world. And I was running with my imagination. Now, after a while, you see everything, and then you only have, the only way you see something new is when an expansion comes out. Mm-hmm. What they're creating is the ability to say that you'll always see something different. Yeah, and, rallying calls too, having yeah. players that kind of build yeah, the world. Yeah. Like all, so, so many features. I don't even think we could cover all the features that they're putting in this game in this hour. It's insane. So it, 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 you're right. We can't. We couldn't even discuss like how what we could see what and what's even possible. Like I can log in one day and have a completely different experience from what Tanlin right, does the next day, and then that next day Chewina logs in and has something different, and then Kai like logs in and she's got something completely different the next yeah. day. And and see, and I think that's fantastic, especially when you're not having to do like quest. Pre- quest progression to great to raise your experience so that you're traveling along like the, the rails or going from quest sub to quest web. But you know, if you can just play the game, you know, and, and, and then that was, again, it from SOE live. One of the things that they, they stated multiple times is that if you don't go looking for content, content might come looking for you. And so like, you might be just doing off the thing that you normally do in the game. And the next thing you know, you've fallen into a cave or you've discovered, you're the one that discovered the cave and now you get to explore it for the first time. Yeah. Yep. And that's great. And then looking at that, you know, 
how that's created. They've may have created the largest MMO we've ever seen, world speaking wise. That they've they are now giving us so much real estate, in game real estate to play with. A lot of people, you know, when when Guild Wars Two was um, coming about, you know, a lot of people said, "Oh, this is a lot of real estate. We get land and we get water." Well, we haven't even seen water yet, and we have three we have three tiers to play with, and water is voxel based too, and, and water is voxel based, and who knows what they're going to have underwater. Can you imagine and, how pretty the water is going to be in this game? <laughs> oh my god. And I, I'm sorry, one of my favorite things to do is to see how the water reacts to me in a game. I love to run through water and see, do you see like the splash particle effect from the water? <clears throat> and do you see like the ripples in the water? And and when I did the first, that was one of the first things that I did in EverQuest 2 was to, to go see, can I do that with the water there? So, oh my god, can you imagine the water in this game? Yeah, it, and it's it could be crazy, and and just to think, like, you know, we've heard that you know, vol explode uh, volcanic uh, volcanic explosion is going to happen. Imagine like lava is coming down uh, the mountainside, and we have to dig to avoid the path of it hitting Freeport. <laughs> that would, Free, yeah, uh, redirect and then the flow. Redirect the flow towards water, and that creates new landmass and new. You want to know what's funny about that is you guys are from Florida, but where I grew up in Seattle, they had like volcanic eruption evacuation plans. And it was, oh you know, and they, you, yeah, they had like in public institutions, they'd have like the map, like if lava was going to flow from Mount Rainier, that, that huge mountain over, over Seattle, they, they would show you, this is where the lava would pass. This yep. is where you want to get away from. <laughs> See, we had so. that with, 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 uh, volcanoes and, and with tsunamis in our area. So. That's, yeah, awesome. that's, uh, that's crazy. That's ima imagine that happening. And, and little do we know, there could be tsunamis in this game for all we know. Right? <laughs> they said there's no weather yet. Um, they said they're they're contemplating. I know there's a problem in Planet Side Two with weather, but then again, this is a completely different game. The way the engines built with voxels, so it's completely possible. Weather nothing. needs to. Ha it's a dynamic game. If you can have NPCs that sort of think for themselves and walk around, you better have some rain. Okay, even if it's appearance based, even if it does, it's just a th aesthetic. I want to have it beautiful. I mean, that's what weather is for me. But I mean, even make it more than that if you want to. We were talking immersion earlier, right? And like putting this is a, a, a this is a 2013 and beyond game, okay? I, I mean, if you want to say, you know, shoot for the moon, let why don't we shoot for the moon? Okay, I want to see the moon. I want to see the moon, you know, passing through the night sky. I you already see, have that. I want to see the phases of the moon. I want to see lunar eclipses, solar eclipses, and then if you want to get really down to it, let's do like specific encounters that can only occur like on a full moon. During or a seasons. Eclipse. Let's see seasons. Or seasons, yeah. Uh, start with Let's the see seasons. the textures <laughs> of the ground change if it's fall versus winter, you know? Right. Not just have, like, a winter zone, but actually have the textures change. Like, see snow falling and stuff like that and have, have it snow become... Snow accumulation. Crap. You know, yeah. I mean, you don't have to go that far. That would be amazing. You can do it, I guess, with voxels and actually cave in roofs or you something. Could, you could. You could technically know. do it with voxels. They could stack yeah. and make snow piles. And that then if you're in a... Down to performance. Yeah, I, I just want, can I make a snowman? Seriously? That would be so <laughs> Okay, oh creation. God. Segment. <laughs> EverQuest next landmark. Call, poor call. He did all the work for this, and he was going to introduce it, but he's not here with us. They announced a totally separate game, EverQuest next landmark. Um, it was great, because one problem that we ran into when we were discussing how you can give a player freedom to create whatever, but still have it moderated so it can be immersed in the Nor Narathian world, um, there, you, you can't just let players create whatever they want because you're gonna have penises. You're gonna have spaceships or something. Right. On, did I say penis? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's an whatever. Um, so EverQuest Next Landmark allows players sort of Second Life style, a la Minecraft, to go in. Um, there's separate continents. It's, it's continent based, but it's seamless on each continent. So you have your Norath continent. You can have like a real world continent. You can have a sci-fi continent, and players can go in and they just grab a stake of land and they start creating. Now it's resource based so you have to actually go out with people um, go mine whatever you want to create. Right. We don't know how strict that's going to be because players want to be able to create a lot of stuff so they can't have it like too intensive but um, you could have like rare resources and then players can basically take their creation and get this they can also build with other people via permission so group up with your friends build a goddamn guild city. Let's bring up that tweeter. Twit. Twit. 
The tweet. That's what they're called. All right, there it is. Um, and this is um, a tweet from Rosie Rappaport, who is the art director, and it states, "Guild Cities, you better believe it. You better build it." Um, and then she goes on to say that if you want to get a head start into um, building your guild cities, uh, Landmark is the place to do it. Yep. Um, and she said that later on, there's another uh, tweet that says um, they're not sure how far they're going to let players actually build into EverQuest next. Um, but it could still be stake based. Like, here's a bunch of empty land. And they could uh, use, I think they called them, um, what's the word? Templates, they're like Template. templates. So basically in EverQuest Next Landmark, when you sell to another player, you don't sell your actual object, you sell a template of the object. And it's basically like the 3D mesh of that object, think of it like that, but it's empty. So you have to use your resources to fill it up to place it in the world. So they could do that in EverQuest Next for Guild Cities. They can have things that people created in EverQuest Next Landmark, import it into EverQuest Next. Then you can buy the template to place it in the real world. Then it doesn't break immersion, but still lets players be creative. So that's a possibility, um, but that's still all up in the air. They haven't decided on housing or guild housing, whether it's going to be persistent or anything. It needs to be persistent. Smed said that in 2004, when EverQuest 2 launched, he wanted it persistent. So if it's not persistent in EverQuest Next, I'm going to be pissed, completely pissed. Um, they better make it work. Dave, make it happen. Um, but EverQuest Next Landmark's great. It's social-based. Um, you basically go on in there, if you guys haven't played Second Life, you can travel between the continents. Um, they said you can go ahead and like follow your favorite builder, and when they have a new build up, it'll pop up almost like a, a Twitter based in the game. And it'll pop up and say, blah, 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 created something. They'll have it for reviewers, too. If there's like a certain reviewer that writes great stuff about builds and you like what he likes, you can follow him. And then you can just teleport to that build in EverQuest Next Landmark, just check it out. it out. Yeah, and you can just go check it out wherever you are. You can do it on the mobile. Say you're on the mobile looking at screenshots that they featured of a build that you like. You queue it up. You go home, get on the computer with Landmark, pop over there. It's Minecraft with better voxel technology, with right. Second Life permission building, and the best part, it's seamless. You don't have to go on some Minecraft server to connect to somebody else's build. You're in one game all together. It's awesome. Uh, uh, <laughs> I really like it. That's well, going to be crazy. That's gonna be I, awesome. like, I love the idea of building um, a... At building a guild hall, not just um, building it, um, but coming together and, and agree like, you know, this is what we want it to look like. This is, you know, we want to be a big, menacing, imposing ogre fortress as opposed to a high elf, you know, like sort of more um, stylized, flowing, you know, that, that guilds can, can come together and say, hey, this is what we want to build and, and build it that way. Sounds like a great idea. It sounds like a, a more creative outlook. I'm building Disney World. I'm starting the Magic Kingdom. I'm <laughs> starting Magic time. Kingdom. I remember you Epcot. mentioned that. And I'm building Animal Kingdom. I'm going to go to the park right down the street. I'm going to like take pictures. I'm coming home. I'm building Disney World. Uh, so I, I told I told uh, Kyle is like, okay, so when are we going to build New Schwanstein Castle? See, yes. there you go. And if you're not familiar with it, oh my god, no, so hard. <laughs> But with those amazing voxel tools, like you can place the voxels, you can smooth them, you can chip away at them with smaller uh, vector boxes. I mean, the possibilities are endless for creation. You can okay. create a smooth surface in a voxel-based game. How is that even possible? True. I have no uh, idea. All right, there yeah, is a new, it, new Schwanstein Castle for everybody to look at. That's what I'm building right there. And I challenge <laughs> you, I challenge you to build something more grandeur. Nope, it's all you. Wow. <laughs> I'm looking at that picture. Nope, I'm out. You. Nope. I'll make Disney World. <laughs> well, you like... know, the thing is, is that the, the Cinderella Castle is actually based off of Neuschwanstein's castle. Wow. Okay, is... guys, if there's so... any talented builders and modelers out there, I want you to follow me on Twitter. We're making our Build Disney World guild in the <laughs> next landmark once it launches. I'm going to need at least 50 people to build Disney World. It's going to be challenging, all right? So follow me. <laughs> See, I, I am in the mindset that I like to build things, like, I may build a small shack above ground, then under my next tier, I'll have something bigger and go deeper and deeper and go complete. It's like, oh, look, look, Flattis built the shack. <laughs> like, little do they know, I have everything under... giant castle. I have a giant castle underground. It's like, you guys have no I, I idea. Really, um, yeah, that was one of the other ideas I came up with, is that if you're talking about, like, the, the original drow from Dungeons & Dragons, you know, like, 
So who's going to build like the drow Menzo Baranzin under the ground where the, the, you don't see anything on the surface, but you go through this one little cave and the next thing you know, <laughs> you've got this huge city with stalactites and stalagmites. This girl. Um, uh, and so, well, um, th- I mean, we uh, should talk about the art. Yeah, 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 I think we should. So um, I, I guess so I, I should probably start with just the initial snap reaction that I had when I saw them, Eric, because SOE Live was really overwhelming for me in, in a really positive, really good sort of way. Um, and I was excited about going, but because I didn't play EverQuest or EverQuest 2 before I went, which I deeply, deeply regret now. Um, the reveal didn't get exciting until I was in that moment in that room and it gets kind of electric. I don't know really how else to describe it, but it really was, it was electric in that room that day. Um, my initial snap reaction to that art was, oh my God, it's DreamWorks. I love this. Um, because it does, it really looks like DreamWorks animation. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I actually mean that in a really positive way. It, it's, it's easier to relate to that kind of art than photorealism because photorealism loses its appeal really, really quickly as technology gets better and better, you see photorealism improving. And so you look back at something that's like five or 10 years old and sometimes photorealism just doesn't look good anymore and it's almost scary and unnerving. Um, so my, my snap reaction was DreamWorks, yes, I love it. Um, and then the armor kind of sunk in and I saw those shoulders and I hate to, re- no, the armor looks really good. But the thing that I didn't like was the shoulders. I don't want lantern freaking shoulders on my characters. I hate when you turn your head to the side and half of their head gets sucked into their shoulder and all you can see is like this much of their face and then their shoulder armor, right? <laughs> right? I know it's like this and you but it makes you look That's so manly always... and fierce. Like, look what I can carry around on me. <laughs> I know, but like I the love armor these is... I love the, the... shoulders. It's, it's, see, it's love the shoulders. That's fine. I can't tolerate seeing like a character with shoulders that are like... I did, and I hate the lantern shoulders in World of Warcraft. I hate them. Um, I, and I agree. And over there nodding too. Because yeah. Okay, so when you Hearthstone, what happens? Your character's face goes right into your shoulder. You cast a spell, your character's face goes inside of the shoulder plate, and that's really, like, your armor would never allow you to do that. Yeah. In Warcraft, they allowed shoulders to be a a set to show off graphics. It's like, oh, cool, look at my gigantic shoulders. That fake graphic stags pop out. All right, guys, breaking from the chat, breaking from the chat. Dave Jordison said they've already pulled back on the shoulders due to our reactions, um, and that... They did mention this in the keynote, but I didn't really understand it at the time. Like, each armor set can okay. be, like, switched out, and they said you can customize the appearance completely. So right. maybe if you have giant shoulders, go ahead and minimize them down a little bit on your character to make it look the way you want. That's right. cool. So Yo. so really quick to follow up with, Dave, with what Dave is saying. He says our shoulders in game don't pierce your face. So as long as I'm not losing my character inside of my armor, I don't really mind the big armor. It can look really good if it's done well. And that's just it. World of Warcraft doesn't do it well. Every piece of armor I've ever seen in EverQuest 2 is freaking gorgeous. So if I can have enormous pieces of shoulder plate that looks really good that I don't get lost in, I'm all for it. See, I'm, uh, I'm of the opinion that like um, that armor, that your appearance that in the game, um, it shouldn't be just a paint that they throw on top of the character, the model yeah. of the character, that the armor that you wear, um, depending on what you're wearing, should actually take up, you know, it should flow or it should um, have some sort of model that is added to yours. Um, and I know that, you know, not to pick on WoW or anything, but your chest and your legs, there is no, there is no, um, model that goes on those slots in your armor. It's just a paint that they put on your model. And, yeah. and, um, th- so when it comes to the realism, I like to have a little, you know, if you're wearing plate armor, it should add some bulk to you. Um, Definitely. the depth in the armor does that too. Did you guys see that Kara with the shield? Like yes. that shield is yeah. thick. And, and the lighting technology of Forge Light, like you can see reflections off certain nope. material. You can really see the shadows. Each each object casts its own shadow real time. Like that. His hilt. He had a hilt. Uh-huh. And, and it, was it, was there, it was there. And it was there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, let's and, go ahead and switch to that video real quick. I don't yeah, know, no, 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 totally do it. Because, cool. no, it's a great video. It's a right. great and, video. 
um, and this is one of the reasons why um, when SOE um, was coming up with their art decisions, right, they could either go with photorealism or they could go with uh, the highly stylized that they couldn't, it, the worst thing that they could have done is to go for the photorealism and fall into what is called the uncanny valley. And this uh, video that I'm about to show is a video that explains what the uncanny valley is. Via Rosie Rappaport, of course. Via yeah, Twitter. via... My name is this, gonna talk about these, and this time around we're going to be discussing the Uncanny Valley. I'm gonna keep it a little shorter today because A, I'm kinda lazy, and B, I'm pretty sure most of you all have a pretty basic understanding of this topic already. So, enough beating around the bush, whatever that means. Let's do this. For those of you who have not heard of the Uncanny Valley before, where have you been? Come sit down, it's time for your history lesson. The concept of the Uncanny Valley was introduced in the 70s by a Japanese roboticist named Masahiro Mori. The story goes that Mori likes to build robots a whole, whole lot. And over time, he started to build robots to look increasingly human-like. And the more human qualities he gave to his bots, the more people liked them. Their vaguely human characteristics were charming. They looked like big, bolted, awkward children, and everybody loved them. But as Mori continued to improve his humanoid robots, adding synthetic skin and rudimentary facial expressions and such, he discovered a strange trend. He was surprised to find that people didn't respond to these new robots so well. Oh sure, other members of his field were impressed with his advances, but just being around these robots made people uneasy. This observation led Mori to come up with a theory of the uncanny valley. The premise is simple. If something that is clearly not human is given human qualities, we find those qualities endearing. But give it too many human characteristics and it starts looking like an imperfect simulation, which we find kind of disquieting, or even revolting. But once you get past that and make the object look and act almost like a perfect human again, we start to... We... You know what? Hang on, I brought a chart. Uh, where did I put the... Ah, here we go. This graph depicts the uncanny valley theory. It shows the relationship between how human something looks and how much we like it. Let's start at the beginning of the curve. At this point, the object isn't human looking at all, and people respond to it with a big meh. But if we add a few human characteristics to the object, suddenly it's a lot more appealing. Now it's got personality. It's cute. Or awesome, as the case may be. But then, if we keep adding past a certain point, we hit this huge drop in appeal. Suddenly, the object isn't cute anymore. Suddenly, we are freaked out. But if we keep pushing past this point, eventually, the object will become indistinguishable from human beings, and we'll be okay with it. And that is uh, what the Uncanny Valley is. So, um, my initial reaction to the art direction they were going, um, and going along with what Rosie Rappaport said, is that they had that decision that they were going to make, and then they had to go either photorealism or they had to go highly stylized, and they went with stylized so that they didn't fall into the, the uncanny valley. But I think more importantly, and this has come up before, is that the NPCs are going to change. They're going to have facial expressions, and you're going and and the player characters as they're running around. The, the, the NPCs are going to have to have a way of communicating what they're thinking, what they're going through to the players, and their expressions that they wear on their face is going to be one of those ways that they communicate it. And one of the reasons why you go with a highly stylized art direction is because, just like DreamWorks knows, is that when you exaggerate features, all of a sudden what that character is feeling becomes really apparent. And I think that um, I might not be the biggest fan of that that kind of art in an MMO, but I think that for what they're doing for EverQuest Next, this fits perfectly for what they want. They want you to know what the NPC is feeling without having to interact with it. Just like look over and there's, you know, all of a sudden you notice that there is a change in the NPC. Yep. And that's how we as people interact. I mean, a lot of the times we can tell if somebody's unhappy or happy or frustrated or angry just by the facial expressions that they have or their body language or a change in, in their everyday normal um, things that they do. And if you see an NPC that's normally here and they're there for like two weeks and then suddenly you see them somewhere else and they look kind of sad. You want to find out wait, what's yeah. going on. Why are you over there and why are you crying? So I, I think it's really fantastic. Exactly. You're completely right. As a communications major, that's all they like jam into our head in the first couple of years and in interpersonal is like 97% of communication is all nonverbal. It's that's your right. haptics, it's your mannerisms, it's everything but the things you actually say. It's funny that we don't actually really listen to what a person's saying. We just huh? watch them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that's probably why we have such crappy memories. But to be able to do that on a character is amazing. It really is. Um, but I'm going to be critical here. I'm going to say that stylistic art's awesome. 
what we saw was kind of to Disney. I really liked it when I saw the staff on the, the wizard and the way the clothes interacted and all that. The graphics are beautiful and the art style plays to it, but I think at the same time a lot of it's not gritty enough. It, um, I really, really loved uh, Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning, if you guys ever played that game. Very that artistic, but gritty. Game. I just like walked around the game when I went to like the Elven City with all the leaves and everything's made of leaves. Like It was just, whoa, awe-inspiring. I haven't seen that in EverQuest Next yet. The zone, the desert zone they saw showed. I was like, "Oh, that's Indar from Planet Side 2. That's creative." Um, it had some really cool things, but it wasn't awe-inspiring yet. I haven't seen that yet, and that's what I'm really looking for. If they're going to take the stylistic approach, it has to be done to the max. And same with animation. If they're going to go like silly animation, I don't think it's going to work as well. I want really high-quality animation, like the heroic movement and stuff. That was so choppy. I know it's early, and they're going to work on that, but. I just want to nail home that they have to have beautiful animation. They have to have a beautiful way of delivering this art style if they're not going to give us kind of the, the nitty-gritty details that we want. I, I think that it's there. Because if you watch, like, um, and I mean, because they went with an art, a, a cartoony, uh, compared to anime, right? Like, go watch the, the anime from the 1980s and then go watch, like, even um, Avatar, you know, lit, right? And they're able to demonstrate full combat moves in an animated setting that they couldn't do like 20 years ago. It's just progressed that far. True, but I just don't want it to be jumpy. Like, no, I don't, I, I don't either, but I think that they can do it. It used to be heavy. I think they can do it too. Well, if, if, they're just planning, needs to be done. if they're planning on on making a level of animation so detailed that you can tell what someone's class is by the way they're moving around with their sword, then I'm sure that they planned on, you know, having sufficient enough animation to, to, to really make it, you know, not photorealistic, but anime realistic. And that's the only way that the 8-button combat's going to work is by having a tight animated character. That's, you, like, if you have 20 buttons to use, you don't really, like, all right, flashes of light go off, my hand, you know, blips and fires, you don't care. But when you have only 8 buttons, you want it to be flashy, you want the art to be tight, and you need it to be tight, you need... When a warrior, and I love warriors, if I'm a, and I'm a dwarf warrior, if I'm going to swing my mace into somebody's side of the head, I want it to feel like I just clunked the hell out of that dude. And I want it to feel like I actually did it. It needs to connect. And like I said, you eight, give me eight buttons, I'll do eight buttons. But make it chunky, make it big impact. Like, like the mage, like I said, the big suck everybody in, blow everybody up. That's a good animation, and that, that's yeah. what we need to see. That's yeah. we need to see more of that. I want ragdoll physics. I mean, the the game's physics based. It's phys x based, I should say. So that's how they uh, generate all those particles with the stones and everything. That's all particles that you're seeing. It's not voxels being thrown out at that point, I believe. Um, but I want to see where what you're just talking about when you hit the guy in the head. His avatar actually reacts and falls to the ground because you hit him in the head versus somewhere else. I, I don't want just silly death animations and stuff like that. I want so, it's possible. They they said they can do um, ragdoll physics in Planet Side Two. If they can do it in Planet Side Two, incorporate ragdoll physics somehow in EverQuest Next. If I cast a fireball and a bunch of goblins die by it, I want to see their corpses fly in the air. That's the way to get us nitty gritty stuff and still stay art, stay artistic. So we're talking about like this animation style and like wanting it to be a little bit grittier and a little bit dark. And every time you guys say that, it makes me think of and it's not animation, but it still makes me think Dark Crystal because it's gritty and dark and still it all have to be dark cutie, but yeah if that makes no. sense like it's still kind of cutesy but at the same time it's kind of gritty and dark oh yeah it, um actually jim henson company is a great way a great example of that uh i don't know if anybody's ever seen jim henson storytellers uh it used to be on hbo yeah i have seen it it was the, still they were muppets you know every, everything was muppet based but they were still telling like crazy like greek mythology tales and stuff like that the minotaur it's like oh it's a minotaur but then the minotaur swung an axe you're like oh wait a minute <laughs> i'd still be terrified of a muppet with an axe <laughs> i am terrified of birds to this day because of that man i mean the, the bird things and oh no so it's totally but the good thing is i mean if you have a stylized art you know for a game the game can go on for ages and not Old. I mean, not, not and I, I don't yeah. want to use, yeah, I don't want to use Pixar as an example, to, you know, too much to, I don't want it to be a super comparison, but look at, uh, you know, Toy Story 1, 
Toy Story 1 today still looks amazing. Oh, yeah. So, that's something to keep in mind, that this game will still look good for years to come. I and it's not even out Toy yet. Story 3. Did you guys cry when you saw Toy Story 3? I did. I'll admit it. I, I saw it in IMAX, I dude. Like I was sitting there. Just... Uh, it, was just, it was sort of the whole like childhood growing up, because I grew up with Toy Story. I'm like I'm like Andy's age. So oh my I'm god, like, I was an adult like, when Toy Story I'm came like, out. I'm like, Colin's just coming on, and I'm growing up, and it just like hit this emotional point within me, seeing the characters go through it. Like If they can have that kind of emotional depth in EverQuest Next with these exaggerated features I and these emotional... I still all my hair when Toy Story came out. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if they can create the same feelings that a movie can with these characters, they can create immersion that we've never seen before. So the stylized approach, may people are knocking it right now because it's not as beautiful as, say, other games coming out. But if they take that stylistic approach, give us maybe a little more grit, and just give us those awe-inspiring like, landmarks that we haven't quite seen yet, landmarks. Um, it's going to be beautiful. <laughs> That's because the players are going to create it, duh. <laughs> In Landmark. Um, let's go ahead and move on to our next subject. Everyone knows that EverQuest Next is an open development. SOE is super great recently, starting with Planet Side 2, about taking player input and changing the game. Planet Side 2 has changed so much from player input, it's not even funny. They've actually taken like mocks that players have done and put it in the game, the new squad window and stuff. A player created that in Photoshop, put it up on Reddit. The devs liked it and put it in the game. So, as Dave said earlier, they've already made the shoulder pads smaller. So, basically, the round table on EverQuest Next works as if... Like, it's sort of an open communication platform for the developers to interact with the players. It's, it's almost pretty much, it's simple right now, and we have some, uh, some silly ones on there. But it, it's pretty much just a poll. Um, they poll players right there, and then you can discuss it in depth in the forums. So let's go ahead and run through those real quick. Um, we're going to start off. Some of the silly off, ones are good, though. I like Some of the silly ones are good. So let's go ahead and start off. Let's not start off with this one, Tana. Let's start off with uh, to what degree should players be able to change the world? Uh, we hit on it a little earlier, but... What do you guys think? Oh, is that what it is? It's the appearance of the armor. And my take is simple. Uh, if you're going to give them tools like uh, Player Studio to be able to to create whatever armor sets they want, then there is no don't don't limit us. No, well, make it fantasy based, but, but still, you know, if it if should it, you have a bikini? <laughs> Does that break immersion? Rift has bikinis. Terra has armor that's a bikini. Here, here's my thing. Listen, as long as my male dwarf can wear a bikini, everybody should have bikinis. <laughs> Don't let bikinis sex. That, that's okay. Should well, that be a hey, if, feature? Since it's not as based in a world? I gotta wear something over go, my armor. <laughs> I'm gonna go with... It, it needs to be realistic in EverQuest Next. That's for me. Landmark, I think we should be able to do If I want to be an astronaut in Landmark, let me be a goddamn astronaut. But if it's in EverQuest Next, if I'm in Norath, make it believable for me. Let me interact to a point, but also I don't want to break that immersion with silly kittiness. That's that's me. What do you guys think? I, well, I, guess I You know, I actually had another suggestion, and that in other games I've played, they've had different rule sets for like immersion, depending on what type of server you go on. So maybe have one free for all um, server, like there, you know, if you, you know, do whatever you want, and then have one that's like high immersion, like high premium role play immersion experiences. That's the, it. The only control that I think I should. I mean, the, the control that I want, I should say, when it comes to the appearance of my armor, is if I'm saying playing generic, completely dark elf rogue, and I get tier 3 armor. I don't want my freaking tier 3 armor to look like everybody else's tier 3 armor. Let me freaking recolor it. Let me tweak a little bit of it. If I want a skull in the front of it, can I put a skull in the front of it, please? I don't want to look like everybody else in that game. I want to be able to dye my armor. I want to be able to change something about the armor. If I don't want the shoulders as big, can I make them smaller? If I want the shoulders bigger, can I make them enormous? See, I like that. Yeah. I just don't know if I should be able to have a bikini and go out and attack <laughs> See, what I'm now, remember, I mean, maybe it's a completely, show. make it completely armor. Make it not appearance, okay? Uh, well, I, I was going to say, so you know... If I put on a bikini, well, I'm not going to get anything from that bikini. I'm going to get hit like a truck. Well, Let you me know do what? It, but Maybe we can have bikinis and make it realistic. Exactly. I mean, because really, what what are you getting out of a bikini? But boob and butt <laughs> protection and really, I mean... Not it's even the that. Of a big fight. <laughs> hilarity. That's the hilarity. Right. That's hilarity. Hilarity ensues. <laughs> Next question is, should female dwarves have beards or not? Yes. Hell yeah. Absolutely. Have you seen brass? I was gonna say I love beards. brass. Um. Am I the am I the solo dis 
I think you maybe the same. Women should be able to have beards. Women can have beards in real life I, if they want to. <laughs> or like, should they be forced to wear a beard, or should they not? Well, then, then we ch change the well, question. Well, then fine. Make an appearance must, item. Sure. Must female dwarves have a beard? No. No. I think it, it should be optional. It is an EverQuest too. It's optional. optional. I say optional. I would yeah. say Brass has been sporting the beard for this long. I think that we could allow female dwarves to have the option to have a beard on their face or not. Yep. I'm fine with that. I'm good with that. <laughs> That's that. I'm, it's a sandbox. Let players do what they want, except mm -hmm. wear bikinis and attack mobs. Okay, uh, the next question. How complex should the landmark design tools be? I'm going to say, go ahead. <laughs> I'll I, the last. So I want tools like everybody else gets. If you're working on this game and you have X, Y, and Z tools, give me X, Y, and Z tools because I want to be able to play with what they're playing with. I want to be able to do what they're able to do. And so my skill set probably isn't going to be nearly like what they got. It'd still be really cool to be able to sit and go, holy crap, I'm playing with what the devs are playing with. I want it all. I'm greedy. Uh, I, I agree. I mean, you know, I'm not going to be able, like in Minecraft, I can create beautiful things and it's only blocks. I, I can't imagine what, I, what I'll be able to create given a tool set that game creators are using. And I can go bring, bring it down to like the little like crumbles of rock eating away at things, make things look like they've aged and, you know, over, you know, corroded away. And I can't imagine, I just can't imagine, like, what I can do to a building that I create and make it look like it's worn down. And, and that's, it's going to be beautiful. My only is, is that if it's going to be as powerful as the developer's tools, don't make it as complex because I, I don't, I, I don't know how to just make it simple and I'll play with it. If it's too complex, that'll be... The complexity of understanding how things work, like the tool sets, is going to be one of the things that keep me playing the game or push me out of the game. If it's too complex, I can't. Yeah, I, okay, I I'm agree. I'm going to agree with that. Um, I'm going to say uh, low skill floor, high skill ceiling. Absolutely. Um, make yep. a system where it's easy to use, but that those who master it and keep playing can make stuff that other people necessarily can't just because of the time they put in and the way. Second Life was complicated, okay? But it's exactly what I want to see in EverQuest Next Land Mark. If you've never played, you put a polygon in the world. Of course, it's voxel-based now. Um, but you create these things, and you can link them together, and you can modify everything. You can add scripting and physics-based. I want to see that in EverQuest Next Land Mark. I want to be able to make a roller coaster. I don't want to just be able to do buildings. But I want to be able to just go crazy. And that's the kind of tools I want to see. I want physics-based tools. I want appearance tools. I want to make things like kind of transparent, all sorts of things. Let's go next. OK, next question. Should the Rotonga be in EverQuest next? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, I don't see any reason why not. I'm a, I'm a fan of creating more opportunities for um, player characters out of races. It doesn't... Yay yeah. for me being muted. I say yes. Because I'm, pretty <laughs> sure, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that Pentapod is watching. I think I saw her talking a little bit earlier. And if I'm not too badly mistaken, she plays a Ratonga Dirge. So I think we should definitely say yes to that. Okay. I'm going to say yes as long as I can kill the Rotonga. Oh, you might. Oh, 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 it's, uh, kill the Rotonga. Let, well, yeah, you could be a Rotonga. Let me see. Watch you. Kill 10 rats, right? I mean, but what happens if you don't kill 10 rats? You get They Rotonga. become Rotonga. Like, yes! <laughs> <laughs> they mutate. <laughs> Last question, and this is probably the most controversial. Um, should all races have access to play all classes? No, I think there there should be some... I mean, you're writing all this lore. There should be something there. I mean, I, I, I should at least go through trials and have to learn it in a different way. You may not be able to start out with it, but have the ability to discover it and learn it. It's like, all right, well, Rotunga can't really be paladins, but doesn't mean they can't learn to be a paladin and, and take trials to become a paladin. They may not be able to start off that way, but have them learn to be, become that way. You know, you know, yeah. let you know, multi-class, but still have some sort of RP, you know, ability in there. 
I'd, I'd like to see that. My my quick answer to this is that certain class, like the classes, are there, sorry, the races should have a set amount of starting classes to select from and beyond that you have to gain access to them however the game is allowing you to to gain access but should it cut you off if okay this is the this is the stereotypical example if uh, if i become a paladin can i still be a shadow knight in the same character yes they've already said at the same yeah, no, time but should, I, should i be able to is the question why not i mean so so darth vader wasn't always evil was he but then and it's he not, became good in the end again between, so why yeah. not so he I, was good then evil then good again i mean if the Jedi can do it. Why can't we? Yeah. I, I, um, my quick answer is that I, at first I wanted the preference. I wanted like it to be a choice, an epic choice of, of defining moment for your character, either Paladin or Shadow Knight, never both. But uh, they've already said that, you know, you're going to be able to collect, um, classes. Um, and one of the, one of the core philosophies that they put down is that you shouldn't have to create an alt to experience the game. And so if Taking that and framing my answer is that, well, if you make a race specific class, then I have to create a race of that, you know, that can play that class if I want to experience. So that's my answer. No, if you want all, all, you know, if I don't have to create an alt to, to experience a class, then don't, don't restrict it. I will say, and this came from an, a conversation that developed from the um, EQ next IRC channel is that what we could do to make it more lore uh, flavor add some lore flavor to the character creation process is that different races start with different options available at character creation so yep. that so that it makes more sense from a racial profile point of view like they this is a this is an orc um let's not let it start with a real scholarly class i'm fine with that as long as it can pick up that one through the appropriate amount of you know proof as a character that he's doing things that that demonstrate that that's what he is like if a if a dark elf wants to be a paladin well are they you know doing good and being you know doing whatever i'm fine with it um so again no racially restricted classes um unless you want to restrict them only at character creation okay yeah. here's uh chewing his monologue <laughs> um, I, Euphladis is the person who actually kind of disagrees with this from what I understood there. And he actually has the perception that a lot of people have. Um, classes are a way to tell story. They're a way to do lore. Um, but I think that's limited. I think that's a 1999 standpoint when it comes to it. When you had these limited technologies and these limited ways players can interact with the world, you had to make the classes sort of tell the story for you. I don't think that's necessary anymore. I think that in a sandbox game, you should be able to collect whatever you want. You should be able to be whoever you want. But I do agree that you need trials and that maybe if I become a paladin, I talk to good people. Um, and maybe it's harder to become a Shadow Knight later because the evil people don't want to talk to me right away. Or, you know what, get rid of good and evil. I don't even think you need that. I think class is not as necessarily an RP element, but as a way to that players interact with the sandbox. And in a sandbox, you do not want to limit how players interact with each other because that's part of the game. Part of the game is collecting all those classes and, and limiting what you want to do and choosing who you want to be in the world. I mean, I'm limited by my intelligence, so I can't really become an astronaut, I guess. But um, in a sandbox, that's a perfect world to play there. I should be able to do whatever I want. That's the whole point of playing the MMOs, is to be able to do stuff that you can't do in real life. So why not give the tools to the player and let them have fun? Just make it so it's not easy to get all of them. Don't make it all a rift where they just give it all to you. Make me go on giant, long, epic quests to get these. And I'm, that's what I want, definitely. And I know a lot of people will disagree, especially with the story. Um, they'll still stick to that point that you need a strong class with a strong backstory. But I think that players can create those backstories themselves. I don't think the game needs to do it. It's sandbox. Put the power in the hands of the player. All right. So do we have time to rapid fire through a couple of videos and links that we found online? Yeah. Oh, well, right. we didn't even go over SOE Live. No, we didn't. Do you want to go back to it? You know what? What we'll do is we'll we'll hold off our SOE live for the next hour for the next hour because yeah. Rec was there too and yeah. we yeah oh, okay. perfect to bring Rec in because we know that he was exactly there. so we'll hold off on that okay and I'm gonna rapid fire through a couple of videos and links that we think that you guys will find interesting uh, the first is an interview with uh, Dave Jordison. about hopefully we can talk a little bit about um, PVP. Uh, with the destructibility, the creativity, the being able to put these uh, items inside of actually EverQuest Next, 
is do you see that as more of an I'll call, maybe call it an elder game or you know a traditional like guild larger guild goals I guess I'm is open PvP going to be a big part of that? That's the other thing we're really reserving for later. All I can really do is confirm that we'll have PvP. Um, but I mean, let your imagination go nuts because I mean, with the with the pieces that we just showed. All right, uh, that was an interview confirming PvP. <laughs> uh, next is a. Um, what should I pull up? How about the the beautiful picture of the world of EverQuest next? Um, and then. If you have not downloaded the augmented reality um, iPhone or other smartphone app, I, I highly suggest it. Um, as you go through and the play the game, it will unlock different um, quests. And someone here and on YouTube stitched together all path. 10 of the videos from SOE Live into one video. We'll just let, let it run through for a couple of seconds. Armor. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, we're not going to show all of them. And don't go look at YouTube videos. No, 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 don't go, go use that goddamn app. Right, it's a cool downloaded app. an app. I, I think uh, Kyleste uh, downloaded it earlier today, um, and she's going to upgrade the operating system on my phone so that I can. <laughs> it's super nice. I have it. I play. I, I completed all the quests so far. I'm waiting for more to come out. Already got my 500 station you cash. Questaholic, so. you're one of those. I, I, I killed them the first day that app came out. You're one of those guys who hit <laughs> 100 in a okay, day, so aren't so you? So I understood it that you had to have, um, like, it was a little image that was found on your, your lanyard that you had to scan with your phone Didn't to work unlock on it. The lanyard, though. I tried. I will talk more about that after <laughs> after hours. All right, well, uh, why don't we get I ready to? I completely agree. Why don't we talk? Um, get ready for the break and come back next hour. Uh, Flatus, if you have any final comments, uh, here's the floor. Uh, guys, uh, this has been episode uh, two. It's been crazy <laughs> craziness we have so much more we could talk about uh please stick around um if there's anything else we'll see you uh, in the after show camping in five four <laughs> oh wait 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 three. we have a video to end with don't forget yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yes, oh, that's right or we next had a talent competition this year which was so much fun uh or yes. next let's show his video it's not the highest quality yet i can't wait for a high quality version but this is his little everquest song he did uh, enjoy guys uh, and see you at After Hours. Game, X. <laughs> Ever found yourself battling a snake in the sand when suddenly a madman comes charging over the hill screaming, damn my
Get ready to play that game. <laughs>